Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is that of the Bane family murders. Buckle up, we've got sparkly gin and this one is spicy. Let's go. Sin and Tonic! Now, today's case was an extremely high profile case in New Zealand. We're heading there today. Our story will take place on the 20th of June in 1994 in New Zealand at 65 Every Street. Oh, there may be some names, words, things that I get wrong. I thought I'd be okay because it's New Zealand, but there are some words that I, I have struggled with. So I will do my best. Apologies if I get anything wrong. Bound to happen. But let's start with two names that I can pronounce and they are the head of the family that live at 65 Every Street. That is the wife and the mother, Margaret, and the husband and the father, Robin. Robin and Margaret, they met when they were in their 20s and I did a little bit of research because I wanted to go back a bit with this case and... and everything was not as it seemed. I've gone down such a rabbit hole with this one guys, such a rabbit hole. It has been days and days of me like oh like mulling over all the things that I've read and like going back and thinking oh I'm just gonna watch one more interview and things like that. So it's been yeah it's like White House murders to me. Uh, yeah I've definitely been dreaming about this one. They were married in 1969 and then they had their first son, David. David was followed by two daughters and another son. Names, Aurora, so sorry if that's not correct, and Laniette, and the youngest son, Stephen. I can do Stephen. Now, the family spent quite a lot of time in Papua New Guinea. They moved out there. What a fun thing to say, Papua New Guinea. We like it. They lived there and they did missionary work. They were both devout Christians. Their faith was very important to them. And that was their calling, their purpose in life at that time. So they lived there with their children, their four children. And Robin worked as a missionary. While Margaret was looking after their four children, homeschooling their four children as well. Looking after the house or meant to be. And this is where some sorts of divides began. She was unconventional and it didn't really gel very well with Robin. I'm not sure. It seems like they weren't on the same page. That's what it seems like. These are pages. They weren't on the same page. Margaret was on a personal spiritual journey and therefore Robin felt that Margaret was dropping the ball with homeschooling, keeping the house and her end of the bargain. I don't know whether I want to paint a picture for you of the squalor that the family lived in. This is another level. This isn't just a messy normal house. This is, it's another level. That's all I'm going to say. Well, for example, let's go for an example. Margaret would sort of can fruit, tin, sort of, you know, put fruit in jars and can things and stuff like that. Live off the land, don't waste anything, can fruit. But then they wouldn't eat this. They wouldn't eat the fruit. So then this canned or jarred or tint fruit would just go yeah. mouldy. And there was no throwing that away. That's just one little place in their house, like some canned fruit, just all like moulding and going. <laughs> so yeah, for example, the kids were feral. They'd often be running around naked. It didn't seem like there was many rules, discipline, not much of that going on, not much homeschooling going on, and probably for the best though, because she had some wacky ideas. Like I said, Robin did not, he didn't gel with this lifestyle, he didn't agree with it, it's not what he wanted for his family. This was Margaret's journey, her path. So, Margaret, obviously wanting to keep her marriage together and trying to fight for it, trying to salvage something out of this. She got in the help of a psychiatrist. She knew they needed a professional and they had a psychiatrist come to the house. Only the once, because that woman never went back again. Like I said, stay of the house. So she was like, this is too overwhelming and too much for one person. And she actually did suggest, like she laid out a plan for the family and said, this is what you need, X, Y, Z, and you, you know, these are the people that can help you, but it ain't me. 
during this time, Margaret seemed more concerned. What was that noise? <laughs> during this time, speaking to the psychiatrist, Margaret seemed more concerned with losing control of her children so as your children grow up you know they find their feet they become independent she wasn't down for that she didn't dig it she didn't like it and this seemed to be a big issue for Margaret. Margaret was quite concerned with the fact that she would lose control of her children they would then challenge her which just that doesn't like challenge her you know that doesn't feel right does it and sorry the hands are all over the gaff today she felt that her kids would challenge her and that Robin, their father, would then gain more of their respect and their trust and, you know, so that just feels like a weird competition, doesn't it, between a mother and a father. Like, oh, he'll gain, they'll, they'll like him more or they'll gain his, it didn't, that didn't feel right to me, that felt off. Obviously, it's off because they're getting help for their marriage and their family and all sorts of things, so it's not right, is it? But, yeah, it was a really odd sentiment to have like oh they're gonna like their dad more weird the children weren't happy with their unconventional lifestyle either the eldest daughter especially she wanted to be normal and very sadly margaret just lacked any respect for robin at all there was such a lack of respect he people would describe robin as an empty shell like margaret had just beaten him down there wasn't much left of him she she thought very little of him that was a bit horse-like wasn't it she was the the force in the house she was the she was the one and she liked it that way clearly because she was so concerned with losing control and her kids challenging her so very odd situation 14 years they lived in Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea. and had this unconventional lifestyle unhappy marriage unhappy children well, unhappy Margaret as well. After 14 years, they would return to Dunedin. I believe that's how you say it, Dunedin. I've realised just now that I haven't made a single attempt at a New Zealand accent. <sighs> can't, I literally can't think of a single thing to say. Isn't it just, is it similar? To, it must be similar to, um, I don't want to try because I don't want to offend anyone. Again with the horses. Zebras. Not going to risk it. This move back was an attempt to rescue their marriage, give the children better opportunities, patch everything up, make everything good. Because we all know that if we move, we can just like completely outrun all of our problems. The family massively struggled with this move back. They've basically lived a very unconventional lifestyle the children have been described as feral and then they've gone back to Dunedin and this pretty much a culture shock a culture shock is what it was and everybody struggled poor Robin struggled to find work as well originally so they've come come back here and he's got to find a job and provide for the family and that didn't go very well to start with so just lots of stress being piled on top of this family when they returned, Margaret just became very depressed. She moved into a caravan in the back of their garden. I'll share a picture. And she lived there for six months. So she, she removed herself from the family home, interestingly. And she would potter about, live, live her life. She would have sort of... Th this was weird when I read this. She would have her children sort of come and have little meetings with her in her caravan you know, little chats, one by one. Maybe there's, maybe that's not that weird. I don't know, it just felt weird. Like, you know, felt like they were going for an appointment almost to, to update her. That's what it, it read like, but I, that might be incorrect. She felt like the people in the house were bringing her down, oh, her family, and she started to journal. So she, she, she journaled every evening and she would write everything in these journals. And she would say that she would spend her days crying or meditating. So a really unhappy woman, really unhappy. After six months, she was fed up. She felt really cut off, even more so than before. So she decided that she was gonna move back into the family home and she kicked Robin out into the caravan instead. Uh, like, it doesn't sound like he had a choice in that matter whatsoever. She was like, I'm in, you're round, go, go, go. 
It gets worse. It gets darker. Stay with me. Like I said with the journaling. So the journaling got much darker. Margaret believed that there's something called, again, the pronunciation, but I think it's Belial. Belial. And it's basically, again, no expert. I feel like I've just been bitten by something. Do you mind? Belial is sort of worthlessness or evil. Evilness, worthlessness. She would describe most people as sons of Belial and that they were they were full of evil and the devil, especially Robin. She used the word so much that in her journaling, in her diaries, she would just shorten it to Bell, B-E-L. And I will too, because I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly at all. So yeah, so everything was Bell this, Bell that, like everyone's full of Bell and like, yeah, really, really obsessed with it. To the point where she then started to believe that food like was contaminated with Bell. Things are going on up here, aren't they? This isn't a, this isn't good. Her kids are filled with the devil. Food's contaminated by Belle. Everyone is has a level of this Belle in them. And she would write even in her journals, like, who had the most Belle? Robin. And she didn't like Robin, did she? And then the least was David, interestingly. This part of the story does conf confuse me slightly, and you'll find out why later. But the second eldest daughter, Laniette, she was the only child to support her father, Robin, in any way, really. She she was his only real supporter, so much so, and this did not go down well with the family. So not only was Robin not respected or, you know, not treated nicely by Margaret, his wife, it seems that she would encourage that in her children as well, that for them to not think very highly of their father. She, of, There was this sort of, you know, she was a bit scared, I think, that she was going to lose her kids to him. So that's all a bit odd, isn't it? But yeah, so she she encouraged that also in her children. Laniette, she didn't go along with that and she defended her father so much so that it, she left home because she wasn't really welcome there. She tried to rent an apartment and because of her age, she needed her parents' signatures to say that she could move out and they would not do that. Without telling them, she decided that to fund her new apartment and so that she could, didn't have to live at home anymore, she would turn to prostitution and oh, that's just really sad, isn't it? She was so desperate to be out of that house that she, she resorted to that and that's incredibly sad. There's a whole kind of world behind Laniette that is so interesting. There's so much psychologically, I think, going on with her that, where do I fit this into the story though? She was a very open person. She shared a lot of personal, but I'm not really sure if it's personal or untruths, about herself and her family with friends, colleagues, yeah. So she was very open and she would be very chatty about things. She would tell stories, but those stories would change. So she mentioned to colleagues and friends that she actually had a child when they were back in Papua New Guinea and she wasn't very old. So that was like quite shocking. But she would later go on to change her story and say that actually she'd, she hadn't had a child, she'd had an abortion. So <clears throat> it kind of leans a little towards low self-esteem and trying to have something about herself so she she told some fibs she would embellish on truths and make things up to shock people that is purely my own speculation but I but it, it came across like that to me that she she liked to tell some tales she also told people quite a few people friends and friends and colleagues again that her own father Robin was sexually assaulting her raping her and that he had been doing so for for a long time. However, she was the only one of his children, and this could go both ways, I suppose. She was the only one of his kids that when he left, she supported him, defended him, and then ended up living with him. So she could have had that chance. It just doesn't sit well. Mm -mm. Again, it could be a tall tale, couldn't it? That's the sort of thing that would get you lots of attention. <sighs> yeah. So much to think about in this one, guys. So much to think about. Got to lose this scarf because I'm. The gin is warming me up nicely. Laniette would bounce from job to job, job to job, and like I say, she did eventually live with her father. 
Between 1990 and 1994, the family crumbled even further. And it's such a sad tale, isn't it? This family just fell apart at the seams. Robin had now been living in the caravan for three years. On and off, because he would sometimes live at... He became... He, he found a job and was a head teacher of a primary school. He would sometimes live at the schoolhouse, pretty much like he'd, he'd work there and then stay there. So he would be there for the week. And then some weekends he would go home. He'd return home to, to the caravan. There are conflicting reports about Robin and his mental health, lifestyle, lots of things here. Some would say that he was enjoying his job very much. He enjoyed his freedom of not being at home. He would spend his time at the beach. He loved teaching. He attended his own children's performances and seemed happy and fine. And others would say that he was not okay and that his behaviour was in, in very worrying and increasingly so and that he was very depressed. So I don't know. I don't know what to tell you about that. But there were very conflicting reports about his mental health and happiness at this time. Laniette defended her dad and moved out. The other three children were very much, very strongly on Margaret's side. She told them that she'd been visited by God. Oh yeah visited by the big man and he had given her all sorts of instructions including that they had to demolish their house right and in its place build a seven bedroom sanctuary for themselves and for others in need sounds lovely this was god's plan but only margaret was to draw up the plans for this house only margaret she had full control Full control keeps coming out, doesn't it? Their home sanctuary would be a place for anybody that needed rescuing because the world was full of the devil. Full of the devil. God also told her that her eldest daughter, Aurora, Aurora, sorry, she was to become a teacher. That was her purpose. And Margaret had to make that happen because this is God's will. David... God said, would be the one that had to build this house. He had to build this seven bedroom sanctuary. It was his job. That was his purpose. So it's all very, very controlled. Because of this plan given to her by God, she could not divorce Robin because he would then, you know, get half of the house and everything and like that she'd have to sell it and it would, that would ruin all the plans. She'd be scuppered. So she couldn't release Robin from her from her claws she, she she probably wanted to because she really didn't like him at all but they couldn't have that finality and have a divorce because she needed this house for her her god-given work Aurora and David started to wear a bit thin the old god given plans they weren't they went into it really David didn't want to build a house and she didn't want to go to school to, to being told what she had to like do like be a teacher and all of this she wasn't keen she didn't like it it was too much and they both struggled massively Aroa was deeply upset but things were kind of it was odd she would express to friends that she just really hated living with David. She found him really unnerving, very uncomfortable. And David could drive and she couldn't. So she had to quite heavily rely on David for lifts to go to school every day and also to see friends if she wanted to socialise. And she would actually end up asking friends of hers if they would come in the car with her on the way to school and home because she just really didn't want to be alone with her brother David. So that's odd. Eventually, she stopped socialising with her friends altogether because of David's behaviour. He would take her to a friend's house, but then he wouldn't sod off. He would hang around and watch them and just really weird. And he caused so much awkwardness that it was just like it just wasn't worth it. At one point, she confided in a friend that they had a family secret. What was that? Do you know what I mean? What was that? And we won't know now because she wouldn't confide that secret in case David would overhear because he was always hanging around and hanging about. Maybe that's why. But what was it? I don't know. But he he was always hanging around, so she never felt like she could actually confide this family secret to her friend in case he heard. And that's just eerie, isn't it? Like, what the hell is going on? 
David himself, he struggled. Like I said, he struggled massively. He was awkward. He didn't have many friends. He was a very odd person. If he did catch on with someone, make friends or like have a, have a nice communication, he would l like literally cling to that person. He would become obsessed with them and he wouldn't leave them alone to the point where then he ruined that friendship. And quite often this would be with a girl if anyone did come to the house, and this was including his siblings' friends as well, they would never return because much the same as in Papua New Guinea, this house was gross as well. It was just so, it was basically dilapidated and falling down. Not long before the 20th of June, when the crime is committed, the council were actually talking about, we need to, you need to demolish your house. Like it's, it's, it's beyond repair. Obviously, Margaret was thinking, yes, I'm going to build my seven bedroom sanctuary. Thank you. But they wanted it knocked down. It was like a, it was hazardous. And this whole family lived there. But not only was it dilapidated, it was very, very unkept, messy, probably very unhygienic. I can't imagine that they ever cleaned from the pictures that I share, you will see what I mean. Interesting nugget of information here for you. David would share with a friend that he had a sexual fantasy, right? And it involved a girl that lived on their street. David did an early morning paper round and he would see her and she would go out for a run. He shared how he would attack this girl in his fantasy with his friend. He would leave for his paper round early that's important to know. So he's had this thought, leave for his paper round earlier than usual to make sure that it's done and that people saw him on his paper round. So it kind of gives him an alibi. And then he would find the girl, attack her, the girl, and then finish off the last little bit of his paper round. So it kind of like his paper round would be this sort of alibi around his crime. Okay, remember that. He'd then return home, normal time, end of the paper round, and it would be like, you know, oh, yeah, David just went, he was on his paper round. Crafty. Let's now jump forward to the 20th of June, 1994, and the weekend of the murders. David convinces Laniette to come home that weekend. Remember, she doesn't live at the family home, and neither does Robin really, but he's in the caravan. So they are going to have a family meeting. Laniette did not want to attend this meeting, but David did convince her. And it turns out that Laniette had a job interview the following morning after the family meeting. And she thought, well, if I do go, David could drive me to my meeting. So it kind of all like tied itself up in a, I was going to say a nice bow, but it did not end nicely. David woke as usual on the morning of the 20th of June and he went out on his early morning paper round. By the way, he's 22 at this point. I thought paper rounds were for like young teenagers. I must be wrong. When David returned home that morning, his entire family were dead. At about 7.09 a.m., David would make the 111 call, which is like 999 or 99911, to the operators to say what had happened. Okay. No, they're all dead. What's better? They're all dead. I came home and they're all dead. Where are you? Um, um, every street. Oh, every street. 65 every street. They're all dead. Who's all dead? My, my family, they're all dead. Hurry up. It's okay. Every street. And it runs off, off <laughs> Somerville Street? Yes. Timings for that morning were as followed, apparently. David would wake at 5.45, as usual, for his paper round. He returned back to the property at around 6.40 after doing his paper round. And he then called 111 to report his family dead at 7.09. The call handler testified at trial, actually, and he noted that the call with David was odd. And on first listening, I was like, really? Okay, because David is obvious, like, well, he sounds panicked, he sounds out of breath, he, sound, he sounds, yeah, troubled. He's not just like, oh, my family's dead. Like, he sounds like, you know, in a bit of distress. And who knows how we're going to react if something like that happens, you know, we just don't know. So to me, I was like, it didn't feel, feel odd, really. 
But when he says what, when the operator testifies and says what he says, you're like, oh yeah. And I have actually, very sadly, been in a situation where I had to call an ambulance for something that happened. And I was on the phone for so much longer than I needed to be because of this reason. Now, the operator said it was just incredibly easy to get information out of David. You know, what's your surname? What's your phone number? Where's your address? These are the things that these call handlers need to get people, an ambulance or whatever, out to you quickly. They're the, they're the, that's the information, you know, it's important. And when I was on the phone, because when he, when he was saying this, I was like, oh my God, he's so right. Because within like a minute, David has given his surname, his phone number and his address. I'm not saying that you should read too much into this because like I say, no one knows how you're going to react in a crazy, batshit, weird, traumatic event. But... From my personal experience, I was like the call hander suggested most people are, which is so traumatised and panicked and like not in your head that you you don't even listen very well to the person on the phone. Like I, I it took five minutes or so, it felt like, for me to say to the operator where I was, what, what was my address? and even to explain what was happening it was just such a jumble of like panic and just getting words out and just like oh this has happened and like not remembering that it's just your address your phone number and where you are your name like none of that just came into like you just it's like you don't even remember it's like what why do you want to know my address oh yeah so it was yeah I do understand what he was saying. And when I listened back to the 111 call, I was like, yeah, he does offer up that information fairly easily and without panic or wobble, particularly. So, okay, do with that what you will. But to me, I was like, mm hmm, yeah, that's interesting. Officers arrived at 7.33 in the morning and they called out to David. David was in his bedroom, on the floor, in the fetal position, screaming. And the police, he wouldn't come to the door. He couldn't answer the door, like, for whatever, you know, having this panic attack or whatever was going on. So he was incapacitated in his room and the police broke a glass pane next to the door and let themselves in. An officer found David and stayed with David because he was not well, while the other officers searched the rest of the house very freaking carefully because once they'd found a dead body and a very traumatised David, they were then aware that whoever had committed this crime could still be in the house. This was a real house of horrors. Guys, I'm not gonna lie. The first body they discovered, and I'm gonna share pictures of the map of the house because it's kind of an unconventional house as well, was Robin, and that was in the lounge room, which is opposite David's bedroom. So they found Robin, he was laying on the floor, he had one gunshot wound to the left side of his head and not far from him to his left side was a 22 calibre rifle with a silencer attached. Laniette's body was found next, it, she was laying in bed with the covers still on her, suggesting that she'd been shot while she was sleeping. She had three bullet wounds to her head. I am consulting my list. Margaret was found next. She was also found in her bed with covers sort of on her and she had been shot once above her eye. Next, they went downstairs and a rower's body was down in the bottom bedroom, so the downstairs bedroom. She had also been shot in the head. They found Stephen's body later on because his bedroom, you had to go through Mar Margaret's bedroom to get to Stephen's bedroom. And it just looked like a cupboard door almost. So they didn't notice it. And like I said, the house was very messy. So it was all a bit jumbly. So they didn't notice that that was an actual doorway into another bedroom until later. And that's when they then found Stephen's body. And his body and discovery was just the most grisly of all because poor Stephen, 14 years old, had managed, had woken up. So he was not found in his bed. He had woken up and he had fought with his attacker. He had defensive wounds. He had a bullet through his hand, which had then grazed the side of his head as well. So he had that wound. He also had a bloodied T-shirt round his neck because at some point his T-shirt had been used to sort of like partially strangle him. Quite a lot of blood as well in his bedroom. All of the bodies were warm suggesting that they hadn't died very long ago but Robin's body was m remarkably warmer than the rest suggesting that they had died some time before he did. David, the only remaining family member, 
had some interesting episodes, uh, almost like convulsions, seizures, a bit unusual, and the responding officers and then the ambulance staff would say that it was just very odd, like the things that he did didn't seem to be real. So they were sort of under the impression that he was faking it, like faking these seizures and stuff, which is just bizarre, isn't it? They even testified to say that they thought this was very unusual. Everything was so bizarre with him. Before he went off in the ambulance, they started filming what he was saying because he was saying some really weird shit. And he was talking about black hands, like black hands killed my family and they're gonna kill me too. Black hands. At this point, he asked for his glasses and a police officer noticed a pair of glasses in his bedroom, but one of the lenses was missing. And then he got taken off in the ambulance. Also to note, David had some injury to him. He had a bump to his head, he had some abrasions on his face, and when they later on when they were at the police station they noticed he had scratches on his torso. So he did have these injuries. He also had a scrape on his knee and like a chunk of flesh missing. With David gone, the investigation continued and it was tricky because the house was so cluttered. It made it challenging for the investigators. They however found a computer. Now in the lounge there's a little annex off of the side of the lounge and in that annex was like a, a home office-y type area with some curtains drawn across it. I will share a picture if I can find one. And in that office was a computer and on that computer was a typed message which read, sorry you are the only one who deserved to stay. Now this would highly suggest, would it not, that somebody else in that house had murdered everybody but decided that David was the only person worthy of staying alive. Police quickly knew about Robin and Margaret's marriage, their situation and also Laniette's accusations that her own father had been raping her for years. With this in mind, it was very quickly decided that this was a murder-suicide and that Robin, the father and the husband, had killed his family apart from David and he had then taken his own life. The motive for this was that he was a distressed man, he wasn't well, he was losing everything and if Laniette then came forward to say that he was raping her, he would have lost his job, which he loved. So it, it built this picture of a desperate man and that that is what happened, but... Delving deeper into the investigation, things would quickly change. There was a lot of evidence. Let's talk blood. Okay, I will consult my list. There was blood in lots of places. There was blood. On the clothes, in the washing machine. Partial handprint on the washing machine, which was David's, who were. On door frames, in the bathroom, in the sink, on the stairs. Bloody sock prints that measured 280 millimetres going from Margaret's room to Laniette's room. Blood on the light switch in Laniette's room. Stephen's room was basically covered in blood. He also had green fibres under his fingernails. Remember the green fibres. There was a pair of bloodied gloves found under Stephen's bed and under a pile of washing. Those bloodied gloves belonged to David. Robin's van was searched and in that van there was no blood evidence but two bullets were on his bed. There were other bullets found that were from the 22 rifle but they were all dusty and old. There were lots of true crime books in his van and one spoke about a family being annihilated by a family member and then committing suicide. But lots of things did not make sense with the story that Robin had committed these murders. Let's begin with the bloodied gloves. They were David's and they were in his room, as was the 22 caliber rifle that belonged to David. David's room was covered with bullets all over his bedroom floor for the rifle. And there was also a thousand bullets in his bedroom wardrobe as well. This would suggest that Robin had come in from the caravan, gone to David's room, collected the gun, loaded the gun, and put on a pair of David's white dress gloves. But why would he wear gloves if he was then going to commit suicide? First question. There were also no fingerprints of Robins on the rifle. That apparently is not that unusual. 
in terms of using the gun in a in a murder but the way that he had to handle the gun to commit suicide and I'll share a picture because it's not just like the easiest way would suggest that there should be fingerprints of his on the rifle and there were no fingerprints of Robin's on that rifle and remember the bloody gloves are found in Stephen's room so they were not on his hands when he was supposedly meant to have shot himself. Two pieces of evidence came to light that had David arrested quick. They were the missing lens from the glasses in David's room. They were then found, they, it was then found in Stephen's room. That implied that David had lost the lens to his glasses in Stephen's room and we know that Stephen had struggled with his killer. Could a physical fight have knocked the lens from his glasses? And that's why it was there. David also had injuries to him that would suggest that he had been recently in an altercation. The minute they found bloodied fingerprints from David on that rifle, he was arrested quick as, because that does not look good, does it? They interviewed David, of course. Let's listen to David's side of this story. He said on the morning of the murders, he woke early. He went on his paper round as per usual. He came home at 6.40, 6.45. He never turned a single light on. This is what he said, even though at that time it would have been completely pitch black inside his house. But he says he didn't turn a single light on. He went up to his room to drop off his paper bag and take his shoes off. He then went into the bathroom to wash the paper ink from the newspapers off of his hands. Again, didn't turn the light on. He then went into the laundry room, took his sweatshirt off, put it in the laundry, went through the laundry basket and also put on a wash load. He sorted through the laundry and put some things in the wash as well. This was part of his normal morning routine. He then went upstairs back to his bedroom and this is when he turned the bedroom light on, his bedroom light. That's when he saw all of the bullets on his bedroom floor and he was like, oh. He ran to his mother's room Bearing in mind on doing this, as he comes out of his bedroom, he is directly opposite the lounge room where his father's body is. But if he hadn't turned the lounge light on, maybe the lounge door was shut, you can forgive him for not seeing his dad's body at this point. Found his mother dead. Then he ran to the lounge room and this is when he found his father dead. At this point, he says he can hear Leniette gargling or gurgling, which is horrific. And this is when he called the police. Kid. Now there are so many holes in that story, where to start? Let's start with timings. He had 25 minutes from when he entered his house, even let's say 20, to when he then called 111. 20 minutes. Even with that faffing about, bag off, shoes off, walk downstairs, wash your hands, put a wash load on, go upstairs, that's five minutes. 10 maybe? 25 minutes before he rang 111. Like, that does not make sense to me. That does not add up. He says he was in a state of shock. Again, we don't know. We haven't been in that situation, but that is, like, bizarre. The laundry room and the bathroom were covered in blood. Covered in blood. Lots of blood everywhere. How did he not notice? Wash his hands. Okay, I can give him washing his hands in the dark, but why? Why not turn that light on? How did he not how did he sort the washing? He said he said himself that he sorted the washing out and put a wash load on. How did he do that in the dark? I don't buy that for a minute that he didn't turn, turn the light on in the laundry room. And if he had, he would have seen the blood everywhere. So no, blood was also on the fricking laundry detergent. So he's obviously got blood on his hands, hey? He says that there must have been wet blood, fresh blood, on the laundry that was in the laundry basket. He's then touched all of that laundry, put it in the wash, touched the top of the washing machine, touched the laundry powder. So he, he says that that blood probably did come from his hand because he got the washing out of the washing basket covered that was covered in blood. Wouldn't you feel that? Do you know what I mean? Like even if we're in the dark and you get a wash load out and you put that in the washing machine, enough for you to leave a bloodied handprint and blood on the soap box. How do you not feel that and think, oh, what's that? Do you know what I mean? Next question. After you found your mother's body dead in her bedroom, why the fuck did you not go straight into Stephen's room to see if he was dead or across the hall to Laniette's room to see if she was okay? Why did he go to the lounge room? Because why would anyone be in the lounge room? Why? 
you know, he was closer to the bedrooms of his siblings at that point. So he could have just, why didn't he go, oh my God, like if mum's dead, you would, you would go and check Stephen's room. It's right next to it. Would you not? But no. And he said that he never even checked. He didn't even go in Stephen's room or Laniette's room. He didn't. So when he makes his 111 call and he says, they're all dead, how did he know? How did he know they were all dead if he'd only seen the body of his mum and his dad? And if you'd just seen the body of your mum and your dad, why would you not assume that their murderer is still in the freaking house? Because that's what I would. Wouldn't you be running for the hills? Wouldn't you be out that house quick as a flash? Just found your parents shot to death. You would run for your life because you would not know whether that person was still there. <sighs> so much, I'm... I'm getting spicy on this one, aren't I? Obviously, this is all just my speculation, but it just makes sense to me. Why does it feel like there's something there that's freaking me out? <laughs> Even his friends really, really believed that he had committed this horrible crime. I am freaking out. He made a bizarre, bizarre comment to a friend where he said, let me quote, if dad was responsible, then I can never forgive him. But if I am responsible, and then his friend cut him off because he was like, well, why would you be responsible? Should have let him finish. But what does that mean? I am seriously getting upset about that, I'm sorry. I watched a scary video earlier and I really wish I hadn't because things like that freak me out for ages. <laughs> Another question that I have is the washing machine timing. He says that he came home at 6.40 or 6.45, that he put a wash on. He said he put a wash, a normal wash load on, normal timing. They even had someone come and test all of the timings and stuff for that. I think it's a fly, I hope so. Not the devil coming to get me. And that timing was like an hour. So the cycle would have been an hour, right? So if he put that on at 6.50, well, the police arrived at 7.33 and the washing machine was not on. It was not running. There was no noise, no sound. It was not running. So, doesn't fit, does it? Suggesting that that wash load was put on much earlier in the morning. At this point, it is really crucial in any investigation to collect as much evidence as possible, is it not? Let's get everything. Gather evidence, collect everything from the house, pieces of carpet, you name it. This is what would need to happen, right? The Baines family relatives, they decided that the house was so terrible, it was such a bad vibe and it was falling down that they should really burn it to the ground. And they did. They burnt it to the ground. All of that evidence, can you imagine? They burnt the freaking thing to the ground. Now, at this point, David is the only surviving family member, so technically, I guess the house is his. That's his house, his inheritance from his family. He's not been proven guilty or anything like that. He's just been arrested, so his property. Well, what do you know? But David was consulted and he wholeheartedly agreed that that house should be burnt to the ground. Of course he did. As you can tell, I do have an opinion on this case. Maybe I shouldn't. and uh, No, I shouldn't. Should I? I don't know. Hmm. So the house is freaking burnt down, which means that so many things were not like retested. There were all of like her journals, Margaret's journals could have had information and so much evidence. They could have retested the footprints, the sock prints, because that was a bone of contention in this whole case. Let me tell you, and we'll get there in a minute, but so many things, they could have gone back and they could have looked again, they could have searched through the house again, but no. David's trial started in 1995, in May. The prosecution had their case against David and it was as such. He got up slightly earlier than usual and he got dressed, got everything ready for his paper round as usual. He then killed four members of his family apart from his father Robin and had the altercation with poor Stephen. He then put the clothes that he was wearing and some other items of clothing that were just in the wash into the washing machine and set it off. Hence the bloody handprints on the top of the washing machine and the wash box. Washed himself up as much as he could in the bathroom, which would have explained the specks of blood that were found in the sink in the bathroom as well. He then went on his paper round as 
per usual. Scary. This gave him an alibi. Do you remember what he said about his fantasy with that girl? Mm -hmm. He went to the lounge room, turned the computer on and wrote a note at some point on the computer implicating his father as the killer and then waited for his father to come in to the lounge room as he normally did at around 7 o'clock for his morning prayer. He then staged the scene and called 111. You're all dead. And that seems, in my mind, plausible. They didn't have any other way of explaining it because Robin's body was so much warmer than everybody else's. So it would have suggested massively that he got up in the morning and killed his family first. And Robin did live in the caravan and he didn't normally come in until seven o'clock-ish for his morning prayers. That kind of fits, doesn't it? The defence, they said that it was a no-brainer. Robin, the father, was the killer. He was about to be outed as a rapist of his own daughter. He was about to lose everything. He couldn't handle it and he annihilated his family, for some reason leaving David behind. Many say that the reason he left David behind in a sick, twisted way was to implicate him as the murderer. So they say that this whole thing was some elaborate plan for him to frame his son for this. But that's an awful lot of effort, isn't it? although stranger things have happened. However, after three weeks of deliberation and trial, David was found guilty of murdering his entire family and sentenced to life in prison. He appealed over and over and over again. And then there is a real twist in the case here. And this is where it gets spicy because some guy who I believe is very famous in New Zealand, by the way, New Zealand, like they love their rugby a lot. The All Blacks and things like, you know, they live for it. This guy, Joe Carum, used to play for the All Blacks. He was a big deal. Famous rugby player. Now, he heard about the case, I think, from some kids that were selling jam or some, some people that were selling jam to, like, raise money for David Bain, to, you know, to say, like, they, they believed he was innocent, so they were, like, trying to raise money to get him out of jail. And Joe Carum was like... Ooh, so he started really looking into this case, into David's case. He looked into it so much that he was almost like another lawyer on the case sort of thing. And he took the case on. He was like, you know, I'm going to I'm going to do this for you. I think you're innocent. He believed that he hadn't had a fair trial. And there were nine points that he made, he brought up that were like, you know, he needs a retrial because of these nine points, which are as follows. Every time I say David Bain as well, I think of David Blaine, the, I was going to say musician, uh, magician. First point was Robin Bain's mental state. In the first trial, I'm going to whiz through them because there's nine points and we've been going a while. So nine points. First one, Robin Bain's mental state was not painted very clearly in the first trial. It was not painted very much about his mental state at the time. Since that first trial, people came forward to say that he was incredibly depressed and that this, you know, he wasn't okay. So that kind of would have swayed the jury, perhaps, if they'd have known that Robin wasn't in a very well state, for example. Children in his class had, like, made stories about killing and murdering their own families, and he decided to publish them in a school letter. So, you know, people were like, he wasn't okay. Second, motive. No real motive was ever brought forward about why David would have committed the murders. Therefore, you know, that, that's odd, isn't it? Like, we've convicted this man. He spent 13 years in prison for this murder. Basically, the nine points are saying there, there was reasonable doubt and he's, he's been put in prison unfairly. So, yeah, no real motive. Third point were the sock prints. David's foot measured, his naked foot measured 300 millimetres. And these bloody sock prints measured at 280. So that's 20 millimetres off. Although millimetres are time, anyway. And Robin's foot was measured at 270. So in fact, Robin's bare foot was nearer to the bloodied footprints than David's, right? I think that's rubbish like it's so they couldn't even retest them because the house got freaking burnt down so I have I hold no weight in the socks I'm, I'm afraid what's this the computer switch on time I haven't mentioned that so far because again I find it just a whole big pile of 
they reckoned that the computer was turned on at 6.45, you know, to write this note, which would suggest that David had come home from his paper round and written this note on the computer and then waited for his dad and shot him. However, the, the, what's the word? Science was just rubbish and it could have been half an hour earlier, half an hour later, and it was just like, that was useless. But again, to be fair, that evidence was used and it was like, it was stated that it was a fact that that was when the computer got turned on, but in fact it was not. So yes, that is something to think about in the fact that he, he, he was miss... Well, that's, that's not right, is it? That's not true. <sighs> Again, the time that David Bain came home. This was later on contested. There were different and multiple witnesses that said he was home at different times and... Again, I haven't really mentioned that in the story that I've told so far because it's all just hearsay. And then this retrial's 13 years later. It's difficult. People remember things very oddly. But a witness, Denise La Laney, claimed she had seen a man resembling David near the family home at 6.45. But the jury were led to believe that her identification was problematic and her timing only approximate in which case David could have got home a little earlier than she claimed and shot his father and turned on the computer at 6.44. So all of these things were claimed in the trial to paint this picture of what happened. And it's all very muddy, muddy water, really, isn't it? All of these things, like, well, this, you know, the prosecution would have just been better off to not really give a timeline, I guess, and just be like, well, I don't know, I don't know. Who owned the glasses? The glasses that were found in David's room were actually his mother's. And then that other lens that was found, that I think that's 0.7, the, the lens was actually found covered in dust. So it hadn't been knocked out in an altercation with Stephen that morning if it was all covered in dust. So, yes. And the bloodied fingerprints on the rifle, they turned out that when they tested the bloodied fingerprints, the actual fingerprints in blood were not human blood. It was not. So this was the key piece of evidence that got David convicted. And actually it turns out that the blood on the rifle in other areas was human, but the actual bloodied fingerprints that were David's were not human blood. So, you know, you can see why it got a retrial. Number nine was Laniette, the gurgling. The jury were led to believe that this proved David was guilty because only the killer would have been able, able to hear her making that gargling noise. But that was, again, they had another specialist come in to say that when a body has actually, you know, post-mortem, a body can make gurgling noises. So he, it would have been possible for him to come in after the event and to have heard the gargling noises. So these are the nine points that led to David having a retrial, and I guess fairly so, because there were lots of things, as I've just read, that came up that were not clear in his first trial. His retrial was in Christchurch. They moved because there was so much like history. Sorry, I'm really hot again. There was so much history with the other trial, and so they moved it to Christchurch. The prosecution, they stuck to pretty much the same case that they had done 13 years previously. A couple of new things went in there. They had some evidence that Stephen's blood was actually found on David's clothes. And they suggested that the struggle with Stephen did correlate to the injuries found on David. And I would say that sounds about right because the green fibres found underneath David's, uh, underneath Stephen's fingernails, if Stephen, fucking hell, if David was the person wearing that green jumper that then ended up in the wash. The, the the injuries to David were on his torso and his obviously a jumper is on your torso or your arms, I suppose. And he had these scratches and Stephen had the green fibres under his fingernails. And to me, that just sort of, that seems about right, doesn't it? However, oh, I'm so sorry, it's so creaky. The defence had good points. The house was freaking burnt down. Like what? Do you know what I mean? Why? Why did that get... Uh, why, how was that allowed? The house had burnt down, so lots of evidence was just poof, gone. And also, lots of things had been cocked up. So, you know, it doesn't bode well, does it? It doesn't look good. It's like, well, they messed that up, and this wasn't right. And, you know, so it, it was a shambles. Robin's hands were not covered when he was taken to the morgue, for example. 
you know, mistake. So normally you would bag the, the person's hands. And it was five hours after they'd removed Robin from the crime scene that they tested his hands for gunshot residue. But gunshot residue is normally gone after four hours. So, you know, that, that's a big mistake, isn't it? Just so much crucial evidence that could not be retested. The jury actually came out at one point to ask for a definition of what reasonable doubt was and the judge had to give that to them so the judge gave them this like down low on what reasonable reasonable doubt means and at his retrial David was found not guilty. As you can imagine many were not happy about this but David did also have many supporters. There were a lot of people that believed he was innocent and that he had spent all of these years, 13 years in prison unjustly and to be honest it's such a difficult case because there are so many things that just, there's these little niggly things that you can't one thing that I thought, which I always come back to, is, and I I'd, I, I listened to um, an interview about this and it, it, it made sense to me, is about like how probable something is. So obviously you can't convict someone and that's why he got exonerated on probably, although that does happen, in fact people get life sentences on less, but it's what's probable. So even though he's free, he's out now, he's moved on, he's, he married a teacher and had a, had, had a family, he's changed his surname and yeah so he, he got free, he, I think he had a holiday when he came out of prison paid for by like his supporters and he also wanted compensation, now that caused a lot of controversy because many people thought he was guilty so he's he, he's now been let out of prison we're going to give him hundreds of thousands of pounds and that is kind of what happened it wasn't called compensation but he did get like nine hundred twenty five thousand pounds so i don't you know that's compen is that not just they called it something else that's not compensation but he got nine hundred twenty five thousand pounds okay it's the rules of the game if he's been acquitted you know that's saying that he did not do it so he wasn't found guilty therefore you know he spent 13 years in prison when he shouldn't have that's what the, that's what I kind of get the gist of however the reason they didn't give him compensation was because he wasn't actually found to be innocent so he wasn't he had to prove that he was completely innocent of the crime in order to receive compensation I don't know what the 925,000 pounds is but it's not compensation but for him to get that he had to prove he was innocent and he couldn't. They were like, you can't prove that you are innocent. We can't prove you're guilty, but you can't prove you're innocent. So no money. But he did get money. Do you see what I mean? <sighs> so the thing that sticks in my mind, and there's so much more probably that I haven't even gone into, I haven't covered. I feel like the nine steps I really skimmed over. I'm sorry. But the reason I've done that is because it's all just, that was him getting to the point of having his retrial. Like, yeah, that, oh yeah, that, that wasn't right. That wasn't right. Oh, that wasn't right. But it's a bit nitpicky. And I do understand that if someone's going to go to prison for life, it has to be without, a, you know, with without reasonable doubt. I get that. But my mind goes here, goes to this. What is probable? more probable. Is it more probable that Robin, I've said that word too many times, it sounds weird, is it more likely that Robin decided, flipped, so first of all he flipped but he was clever and he, he decided that he was going to frame his son, so he flipped but also with like like quite a clever thought process behind it. Is this more likely? So he, he flipped and he decided to murder his family, so he waits for matey boy, Dave, David, to go out on his paper round. He goes into David's room, he takes David's rifle, he puts on David's gloves, he shoots his family members. We don't know what type, what, what order the family members were killed in, but he shoots his two, three children and his wife. And then before David gets home from his paper round, he goes into the snug computer room, turns the computer on, writes a note, not by hand, but on the computer 
to frame, to make it look odd and weird and suspicious and make David look weirdly guilty because it just does, doesn't it? And then shoot himself in a really awkward manner, really awkward, without taking the silencer off, which would have made it less awkward, but no. But hang on, not only did he do all of that, but before he goes to shoot himself, he goes into the laundry room. He removes the clothes that he's been wearing while he's murdered his entire family, washes himself off and then changes back into the clothes he was wearing when he got out of bed, then shoots himself. He didn't put the wash load on though, he just leaves all his bloodied clothes in the laundry basket. Right, then he shoots himself. All of the time with a full bladder, the whole time. He didn't get up and go for a wee first. Nope, just got straight on with it because in his autopsy he had a full bladder when he died. So that's interesting, isn't it? So that is that more likely than David got up that morning and he snapped and he picked up his own rifle and his own gloves in his own room and he went and shot every member of his family in the clothes he was wearing, which he then took off and washed, then goes out on his paper round to make himself an alibi, which he's already talked about previously when he was gonna attack another a woman or a girl, and then come home, make sure that he's been seen on his paper round, come home knowing that his father usually would get up between like when he comes home from his paper round and about seven o'clock to come in and do his prayers, into the lounge room, waits there, writes his stupid note on the computer and then shoots his father. I just don't see how that is less probable. I think that's more probable than his father having this elaborate thing and taking his clothes off and putting them in the bunch. But because they didn't retest things and because of all of this and that and the rest of it, and there's no way of really knowing that, you know, neither of those scenarios are impossible, are they? Both of those scenarios could have happened. It could have been Robin, it could have been David, and he has now been acquitted, exonerated, and he's out living his life. I mean, he served 13 years in prison. Sounds like his home life was absolutely appalling and tragic and horrible anyway. But, and when you see him in like recent interviews, he doesn't seem like that much of an odd ball. But what do you know? Anyway, this case has played with my mind quite enough. Was it Robin? Was it David? What do you think? What feels more probable? to you and what's interesting is that it seems like a real 50 50 divide between people that are like oh hell yeah like it was definitely the dad and oh my gosh no it was 100 percent the son you know so it's like a real 50 50 split so it'll be interesting to see what you all think in the comments whether you think it was david or robin but ultimately it's very tragic because f f five five members of a family just completely wiped out and annihilated like horrible and after just having a really crappy horrible home life as well so it's just all round poo. Thank you so much for joining me today for another episode of Cinematonic. I do hope you can join me next week for another true crime story and a mug of gin. The only thing with the mug and the gin, this gin, it's pretty gin and you can't see it in a mug so I might not do that again. Anyway, thank you so much. <sighs> I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I will see you all again soon. Bye.